Welcome to our PsyD webinar. I'm Bradley Seifer, and I am I head up the PsyD admissions at Divine Mercy University. Today, I am delighted to be joined by second-year PsyD student Anna Lou Azaria. The format for today's webinar will proceed as usual. We'll begin with interviewing Anna Lou before we launch into the PowerPoint slideshow, where I'll highlight some of the most salient aspects of the doctoral program. Um, and we'll finish up with uh, some Q&A. So if you do have questions at any time during the interview or the presentation, please lodge them in the chat box and we will attend to your questions at the end. Um, also note that I have or will list uh, my email in the Calendly link, among other things, in the chat box. So um, I'm always happy to talk with prospective students. So please um, send me an email um, or um, call me and I'd be happy to speak with you. Okay, so um, Anna Lou, um, how did you become interested in clinical psychology? You're on, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess just trying to think if you, so like, what are you going to do with your life? Uh, to me, I was questioning what I found most interesting and to me, like something that's worthy of study. And it's just fascinating. It's just human behavior um, and motivations behind that. Plus, I had that little, you know, just inkling of like, I felt like I needed to help people because I've been very blessed. Um, and so I just just kind of putting those things together, like, what do I find interesting? And um, what can I bring to the table? And it seems like I've always been okay with social relationships. So I was like, you know, it might be a good idea to put that to good use and help. Yeah. So did you study um, psychology as an undergraduate? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I studied uh, psychology and then I did a specialty in clinical psychology and then I studied here. Okay. Uh, started. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a bit about why you decided to come to Divine Mercy among all the other schools. Um, well, that's really easy for me, but it's also like very personal. I don't know if this applies to everyone, um, but I am Catholic. So that's a driving uh, factor. But the other one is I really wanted a place where there was some sort of foundation of how the human person is perceived outside of just like what secular uh, perspectives have, which is just like basically looking at different theories and, you know, that's it. But I wanted to know where I was like, the, like what the ground was, like where we were starting. Um, and it seemed like this university had that with the vision they had of the person. Um, so they even integrated or came up with this model of uh, the Catholic Christian meta model. So it's just an integration, like a lens through which you see people. And I really like that. Um, so I, I was really um, hoping when I was searching for a school um, to keep studying psychology um, that I could find a place that was Catholic and uh, a place that had like a solid foundation of, you know, what they think the person is. Um, cause I felt like some other schools or, you know, my previous education was good, but it also kind of just let you astray or just, you know, didn't answer a lot of questions. So I don't know if that explains a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super helpful. It sounds like, um, you know, you can kind of get lost in all the psychological models, the human personal theories, um, because, you know, they often are disparate and sometimes contradictory and, and not always, um, maybe true to experience so that you know it's a common sense um but yeah i mean the, the catholic tradition being so perennial and ancient it's sort of like something that's stood the test of time as it were right and it's sort of it sounds like it's it's that that thing in particular that you wanted to kind of lay your foundation as a therapist is that fair yeah yeah now that you're saying that um it reminds me like one of the other reasons is um with my previous education, I had come to believe that for whatever reason, um, spirituality or religion wasn't compatible within psychology, which was very um, um, just scary. Because if you talk to people, people usually do have, if, if not a religion, they tend to have some spiritual belief. Um, and it seems to be a, a big part of a person's life um, and not just like any person, like people seem to have these beliefs. 
So it was very hard um, getting educated with this idea that no, you can't touch that um, right. when it when it's a, a big part of people. So I was growing scared of that, uh, of like talking about that with clients. Um, so it was uncomfortable. And I was like, why, if we're trying to explore a person's life to help them, are we not allowed to talk about that? Yeah. Um, it seemed kind of silly to me. So I'm glad that um, at least this model recognizes that a big part of people is that people are spiritual. So you don't have to believe what they believe, but it's something that you can explore and you can work with. So that was also comforting. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, not, not to, it, yeah. So that it's a big part of people's lives, but also it's, it's a big part of human flourishing, right? I mean, to be able to commune with God and to experience his grace and things like that. It's, um, it's not just that it's like common, it's, it's integral to our, you know, our own existence. It's the source from which we come and our, our own teleology, our finality and our, um, you know, our happiness. So, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's like, if that, if all of that is off, is off the table, then, uh, you know, um, it seems like psychology is, um, is there of a, going to have a hard time to say the least okay yeah. um to say a bit then about um some of your academic and clinical interests maybe and you could also speak to you know how they might have evolved um say mm -hmm. in your undergraduate days and you know what you're interested in then and what you become interested here mm -hmm. um well that's a really good question because it's something i'm still asking myself <laughs> <laughs> um but um it seems like I'm leaning towards working with children. Um, and it's funny, it's so weird because in my undergrad or like the experience I had previously, I was basically just getting comfortable with the idea of just not working with kids. Not because I don't like kids, I really like kids, but I was like, how can you help a kid if like the problem is actually the family, the parents, like this is impossible. And I, in my mind, like the parents were almost like the enemy, like I'm embarrassed to admit that, but that's <laughs> what I thought, like you just couldn't help them. Um, and then I started studying here and we had a child um, a psych class, which was very helpful. The model they introduced me to that I had never heard of was CCPT, so child-centered play therapy um and it kind of um it's a I, I like the the rationale behind it like why it works and how it works and how it also elevates the parents and gives them the rightful place as hey you might be a good psychologist but at the end of the day you're going to work with the child like maybe once a week when and the majority of their time they spend at school and with their parents so like like at the end of the day, you're not that important. So if you could actually work with the parents and if they were like your allies, then you no. could do so much more. So it kind of just gave me hope. Like it gave me hope back that I had lost <laughs> with my previous education. Um, and uh, I've been enjoying that um, deeply. So I think I might be leaning towards working with children. I don't know yet though. Yeah. Did, now, was this through um, Dr. Nordling and like the play therapy? Yeah. Stuff? yeah oh yeah he's great that's that's so cool wow well it, it, i mean it sounds almost as like your in some sense your suspicion was confirmed in a way right because i mean it sounds like he's integrating the parents you know with the kids and and therapy and things like that so that they, that they are they do play a role even um you know even if uh maybe not in the way that you had, had expected is that fair yeah, yeah, I guess that's fair. And like with this model, you don't directly like you do work with the parents, but um, there are other like it branches off. So, you know, filial therapy is kind of similar to that one, but it includes like training for the parents, which holds a lot of the same principles that CCPT has. So I was like, OK, there's the possibility of doing things that I thought weren't possible. OK, yeah, great. Now, um, so far, um, I know you're, you know, sort of only in your second year and you have plenty of uh, time to go here but thus far what has been the most sort of enjoyable and rewarding part of your time here and what is also maybe by contrast what has been maybe some of the most challenging and difficult uh, parts of being a student at Divine Mercy? Um, so I would say most enjoyable um, definitely the community here the students um, mm -hmm. 
they are very um very much a part like a part of the life here uh because it seems like the people that are here really have a mission mm -hmm. um and they're not just studying just because like it, it's palpable almost so that's very encouraging and plus they're great people amazing people and just getting to know so many great people is just um very heartwarming so on the one side, I would say students. Um, I yeah. really love my cohort. It's just, we've been, um, I think uh, the friendship part is very important. Oh, so fun. there's one thing. And then the other is uh, the teachers. Uh, they are just so good and they are mm -hmm. so personable and so warm and open to um, just working with students. Um, and something that I think is funny is, and that, that they told us when I came here for my interview day was if you're planning on like you know hiding a little bit not doing the readings or whatever yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to be able to like uh, figure you out because it this is a small university so like if you are here it's because you you want to be here um, yeah. and it's hard work which is what I would say is challenging um, it is a lot of uh, just the coursework is is very heavy <laughs> yeah um, so you don't really have a lot of time to do other things. Um, well, you do, but it's a hard balance that you have to find. So, um, yeah, you just need to be very dedicated and purposefully knowing that you are choosing this program, which is an accelerated program. So even if it's five years, it's still accelerated because you end up with a master's and a side B so yeah instead of the normal what it would it be like seven or I don't know how many years it's five mm -hmm. and uh fifth years internship so that's a pretty solid compact big amazing program <laughs> yeah so it's, it sounds like it's a rigorous program but manageable right you know if you apply yourself well and you manage your time and your life and um you have achieve some kind of a balance it's not um beyond the realm of possibilities no no, yeah. but it is a big challenge for sure. Yeah. yeah. It also seems like the, you know, the first year, the the sheer volume, right, of the courses, right, can can seem daunting. Um, but but here again, it's like, you know, once you become acclimated and once, you know, you get some of your professors, you can see that it's kind of like there there's high standards here, but there's also a lot of support, right? There's a lot of mm -hmm. people that want the best that um, are here for you. I mean, because we are small, there's a lot of emphasis on mentoring and getting people to help if they need should they need it um i've heard some stories of people say that you know for many statistics can be difficult and um not only does dr morso do a great job explaining things but also you know she's um very much available for help um if and when people need it yeah, yeah there's office hours uh which help um sometimes you have to schedule it sometimes you don't but I'll also like your own peers support you a lot or if you have any questions usually people are on the same boat some might know a little more so it always helps to just like check check in with your peers but uh, we also have an academic advisor each of us we're assigned one so if you're like struggling you can also reach out to them so <clears throat> I would say there's a lot of support and the professors make sure to constantly um, ask students like for feedback like are you getting this like do you need more time like what can I do so it's very flexible um, but like you said the standards are high so yeah 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 good okay now um, for those listening what would be maybe some very good reasons for wanting to apply and, and to the society and maybe also some not so good reasons so like good and the bad uh so okay i think this might be easier to explain if i talk about like med school because we all know that med school is just so hard and so uh, so just think about med school and trying to get through med school if you don't have a calling or a vocation that would be very daunting so if you're in it because you believe um that you're going to make a lot of money afterwards or Anything that uh, where the motivation is not intrinsic, um, I think that would be a no, <laughs> like that wouldn't be a good idea because I just don't see how you could see it through successfully because it does require a lot of sacrifice and a lot of effort. So yeah. if you don't have that calling or like a need or like you don't see it as something that goes beyond just what you're doing like day to day, so there's no purpose to it, then I think it would be very hard to just push through because it's also expensive. So yeah, I would say 
it would be very good if you feel like you have a calling, a vocation, you want to, you know, leave your mark in the world. But if you just, if it's because of the rewards later on, I just don't, don't think that would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah, that all of that makes, makes, makes total sense, right? Because it's, it's not short, you know, it's five years, it's not cheap, right? Um, it's rigorous, it's demanding, it, like there's sacrifice involved. Um, but like, I think that well, I like what you, the way you said it, like the intrinsic reward of becoming a psychologist, right? The calling of being a healer in, um, in science and in faith is, is, is not one that everybody has, or at least not in this particular way. Um, and if, you know, you are just want to clock in and clock out and kind of be done with things, this probably yeah. isn't the place for you, right? I mean, you have yeah. to very dearly love people you have to very much um, want to be able to enter into people's suffering and um, accompany them toward flourishing. Um, and that can be an emotionally and sometimes intellectually difficult kind of engagement um, that like just isn't for everybody. So I like the way that you, you phrase the phraseology in terms of like vocation, I think makes a lot of sense for this kind of thing. Okay, so, but it, but it also seems like you know, like, like you said, that like you go back ways, either you, you don't have it, or either you do have it, or you don't, it's like, um, so you kind of answer the, the question, um, by kind of, like, attending to the main point, which is very nice, very good, okay, all right, um, in your view, what are some of the major differences between, um, psychology and clinical psychology and counseling? Oh, okay. Well, I might not be an expert yet, so I think my answer is going to be very brief. Um, but psychologists or clinical psychologists um, can uh, do assessments, and right. they can also diagnose, and counselors can't. So they both can do, like, work, like, as in therapy. You know, you see a person, you kind of, like, work with them, um, have some goals, like treatment goals, and you can go through with it. Um, but uh, the only people that can diagnose and do assessment are clinical psychologists. That's yeah, I yeah. I, I, right. So, so like, you know, in our own program, in our own study program, there's a heavy emphasis um, on the, you know, like the testing. So the testing is huge, like component of um, our own program. Um, and yeah, it's just, it, it's not as extensive. It's, it also seems like, um, the raw uh, depth of the society, right? The five-year program, you're going to get into a lot more of the theoretical um, side of it um, over, you know, over the five course of the five-year program as opposed to, you know, saying a two and a half, three-year master's program, right? So um, that certainly can come into play in therapy, you know, having more knowledge of whatever area of psychology the, the patient has and happens to be um, engaged with, that can certainly help in therapy. Okay, um, what would you say would be maybe two or three of the most formative ideas that you have that you've encountered at Divine Mercy that have been especially impactful in your own kind of thinking, um, like just as a, as a person, but also as a future clinician? I guess just getting familiar with the model the school put together, which I already briefly mentioned. So the CCMMP, the Christ Catholic Christian Meta Model of the Person, um, that has been very important because as I was saying, what I was kind of looking for um, entering this program was uh, a foundation, like a strong foundation. And it seems like, and I also had this kind of like um, sense that it, like you needed somehow to be able to address spirituality or religion not that that was the main point but like to somehow be able to talk about it I didn't think it was possible but then with this model it's like no it is possible so now I'm trying to start to see my clients um, in a more comprehensive way so maybe something I should clarify is that with this model you don't have to be Catholic you don't have to have your clients be Catholic it's just a lens through which you see the person so how do you understand the person well through this model you understand that they are called to a vocation they are relational they are um I don't know like just so many things like you would have to look at the model so mm -hmm. it that's not that doesn't come into treatment 
or, or like how you assess per se, but it's how you see the person, which helps you capture a more comprehensive vision of the person, like yeah. a bigger picture, which I like. So that has mm -hmm. been very um, impactful in the way I see my clients. Well, yeah, I mean, because it almost sounds like you're going back to first principles and philosophy, right? Like uh, that we don't look at the human person in a reductive way. Like this is not just mm -hmm. something like, oh, look at that. Like, well, there's bipolar and, and there's schizophrenia and there's addiction, right? And it's like, it's like, it's that, like that's the human person, right? That we're dealing with. And, and yeah. um, when you have a, as the metal, like you were saying with the metal model, it's like, when you see the human person is so much more than that, then the totality of the human being being made in the image and likeness of the most holy trinity, right? You know, um, with a with a divine finality um, created by God Himself, right? It's it's more becomes difficult to kind of think of the person in any kind of reductive way. Um, yeah. This this is truly like the object in, of of love, you know, worthy of, of love and care and compassion. Um, yeah. Maybe something I should say is that this model is informed by theories like psychological, theological, and uh, philosophical theories. So yeah, I believe it is very comprehensive because of that, like all of the sources it's informed by. Yeah, truly integrative, and including the, all the disciplines that you mentioned, philosophy, theology, and psychology. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, so your second year, um, you're, it sounds like you're interested in working with children. Um, would I would you hope to then do your internship w within um, something related to child psychology? Um, possibly. I'm not sure yet. Because um, right now, uh, second years, we're working at the clinic that's uh, in the university. Mm -hmm. So uh, the kind of clients you see are just like the clients that reach out here right but after the second year we're going to have two externships and then the final year is an internship so the two externships you kind of choose the almost like the type of population you want to work with um and because i haven't had that option yet or that chance i don't know where i'm going to end up uh it seems to me like i am going to want to keep exploring um working with children like maybe try to work at a school or something like that but i also want to expand as much as I can because I feel like right now is the time when I can decipher or discern <laughs> that's a better word for it discern mm -hmm. what kind of work I'm called to do so I yeah I just want to be where God puts me honestly so I don't know if it's going to be even here in Virginia or not like I'm just open or whatever yeah but it sounds like in the third and fourth year you do have some kind of say in where you go right so it's not as oh, a, yeah yeah it's not as if like you just get place like you you get to have some options so. yes exactly like if there was a year where you don't have a lot of say in the matter it would be the second year but I mean it's perfectly fine because you need to work with you need to start with um easier clients to say it like that like maybe clients that aren't displaying a lot of um um like big psychotic symptoms or anything like that that would be unmanageable like they're starting us off with easier kind of clients and then you can make the jump into like whatever you want in future years like yeah, yeah. like the, the so-called worried well population you know people that are mostly mm -hmm. you know they're, they're they they don't have the sort of like extreme um mm -hmm. mental dis mental health disorders like schizophrenia or something like that but they're yeah so this would be fitting second year um patients okay um so I think that's all. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, what I want to do, I do want to look at the chat box, see if there's things that we have not yet addressed that people asked about. Okay. So Sean asked about work-life balance. We did talk about that, right? So it's rigorous, but uh, manageable, right? Um, uh, Kinga, all right. Full-time. Is she also? Okay. So um this is questions asking about marriage and, and dealing um, with the, the program being married, but are you, are you married, um, Anna, Lucy, Anna Lou? Yeah. Okay, but, but you don't have a family yet? No, not yet, but okay. I did get married on my first semester, so it's possible, and I do have uh, peers that are married with children, um, mm -hmm. 
children and children like on the way. <laughs> um, so I know it's possible. Um, and I know it's different if a, a guy is asking this versus a, a girl. I know maybe um, a father uh, would be, you know, you're not actually carrying the child or giving birth. So I, I believe that might, might be easier than if you're a woman. Um, mm -hmm. But I also know that there are um, girl students that have had children while in the program. So I know it's possible. I wouldn't be able to tell you like how hard it is because I haven't had that experience yet. Like I might have that experience and then I could talk about that, but not yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'll have to have you on uh, if that does in fact happen. Um, and then you can speak to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, but, but, but I think, I think that what you say, it resonates with a lot of the other stories I've heard from other doctoral students. Um, in all the situations that you named, right? So like whether you're, um, you know, male or female, whether you're the father or the mother, um, starting families here is, is quite common. Getting married here, um, as you did, is, is also quite common. Um, I like to joke around a little bit with Dr. Kloki and say that we're a quasi matchmaking institution and we certainly <laughs> encourage uh, marriage uh, here. Um, you know, being being Catholic and whatnot. Okay, um, so Kinga is also asking about how big is the Society of Cohort? I mean, those range from 12 to 18 students, so that's pretty small, um, but not also not completely tiny either, so that's sort of standard. Um, mm -hmm. Joyce uh, Hicks is asking, what if you already have a master's level, if you're a master's level therapist, is a program something that you should consider? Right, so Joyce, um, it depends, right, on on what you want to do. Um, there, are sort sort of, you might say, as 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 I'm sure you know, tons of overlap between um, counseling and uh, clinical psychology. Um, but but kind of like Anna mentioned, there's a certainly an increased emphasis on testing, and so your you know your palette of possible tests could certainly be augmented. Also, the depth of the theoretical knowledge, it's sort, of, it's sort of like counseling plus more. So you get more emphasis on testing, more emphasis on the theoretical side of all the areas of psychology, but also um, the, the different areas in which you can work in society are, are often more um, diverse. So for example, it's more likely to, um, you could get placed in a hospital easier with a PsyD. Um, if you wanted to be a clinic director and say employ more people, um, advancements certainly within the health profession is easier with a PsyD. Um, and, and absolutely, if you're interested in teaching, like if you want to be a professor of psychology, almost always requires the doctorate, PhD, or PsyD. Um, and while I would say that of the average DMU student tends, PsyD student graduate tends to do more of a therapy. We have absolutely had graduates that have gone on to um, become professors of psychology and publish, um, conduct research, high level research and things like that. Um, Thomas is asking about transfer credits. Okay, good question, Thomas. So um, we would maximal, maximally be able to transfer up to 18 credit hours um, into the program. Um, so like if you have say a master's in psychology or master's in counseling, you would get 18 maximum. That also means, however, the, or I should say, that does not mean that you're going to spend less time in the program itself, okay? So it's going to still be a five-year program. Um, so bear that in mind. If you have, if you're already a, a master's level clinician and like you, like, you know, you don't want to spend another five years in graduate school, then this might not be for you, but if you want the things that the society avails to you, like the things that I mentioned before, um, and you're willing to put in the time um, and effort, then this could be an extraordinarily rewarding program. Okay, let's see. Yahtzee, hello. Is this program a master's society combination? Yes, um, I was gonna to speak to that in the slideshow, but like Anna Lou mentioned, you're going to get a uh, master's in psychology after the end of the second year on route to the PsyD and at the end of the fifth year. Um, what if you are currently have a master's or a licensed mental health professional, right? So I, I spoke to that already, but um, know that a, a sort of like a related question to that I've noticed is whether, let's say you came in with a master's in counseling, say, or social work, um, and even if you were kind of willing to go through the five years of the coursework, 
the, the clinical hours for counseling, social work, and psych clinical psychology are all distinct. So it's not as if you could kind of come in and lop all of your um, like counseling hours, let's say that you were training in the counseling program and kind of lop them into the, our doctoral program. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, counseling and um, clinical psychology are just sort of academically and clinically um, distinct, especially within the university system. Okay. All right, Joyce is saying that counselors can diagnose, right, okay. Um, Kinga is asking, what is the difference between clinical psychologists and a psychologist without the clinical piece? Good. Okay. So um, you can do psychological research, right? And be a psychologist. Like, for example, we have psychologists here at our own faculty who are non clinicians. So, so like Dr. Morse, for example, um, is a stat. She does statistics. She does statistics and psychological assessment, or so, excuse me, psychological measurement. Um, but she herself is not a clinician. Um, so when where we speak to like the clinical part of it, um, that's distinct from say the research. So in, at, in our own program in society, it's a, it's a doctor of psychology in clinical psychology. So, um, we're training you to become clinicians. So the model is sort of like, um, clinician scientists with an emphasis on the clinical side of things. But like I said, um, you could also become a researcher if you discover that that's your passion, um, at the end of the end of the day. Um, Christopher, is there a stipend available? No, there is no stipend available, though there are financial, um, uh, we do have financial aid process and we do have scholarships that I'm gonna speak about later. So stay tuned for that, but it's not like a fully funded doctor, you know, PhD program where you get like a stipend and tuition or admission. But again, I'll, I'll talk about more of the financial options later on. Okay, um, I saw there are several faculty with relationships with Washington Psychiatric, anyone researching British School, Object Relations Theory, and Christianity. Okay, Anna Lou, do you want to take that one? Um, this person is asking specifically about people researching British School Object Relations with respect to Christianity here. Um, oof, I don't want to say something that's wrong, but um, at the end of the first year, uh, because you start kind of thinking about your dissertation and start working on it like more formally uh, during the start of your second year, um, a lot of, uh, uh, in one of our classes, I think it was like research methods or something like that, um, they invite uh, a person like every start of the class so like uh, either one of the faculty here like professors that have research options and they usually talk about it um, inviting students to maybe uh, collaborate with them um, so there were a lot of people that did mention object relations or attachment or things like that so um, once you get to know the people here, uh, you kind of see what things are available. And even if they're not, you can definitely just reach out and talk about that with them and propose it. And um, like the thing is, you don't have to just run off to Washington knocking on doors, like trying to find your chair. Like there's a lot of people interested in research here. Um, so uh, I'm sure there are people with object relations. I'm pretty sure I heard that from some. Um, but any similar thing related to that would also probably be someone that would be interested in working with you if that's something you're aiming for. Yeah, and, and correct, Anna, correct me if I have this wrong, but I mean, um, I, that seems to be related uh, to Freud. Is that right? You know, like object relations theory? Object, mm, well, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Okay, well, I just want to say real briefly to this question. Um, if 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 you are interested in 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 Freud and things like that, um, Dr. Vitz, are one of our founding faculty members, um, wrote a whole book on Freud and Christianity. So if that if if this question, mm -hmm. the person asking this is has any interest in that debate, um, this is definitely you know historically an area of faculty research, and um, the book that uh, I'm I'm sort of drawing attention to, um, Dr. Vitz sort of adjudicates the debate of like to what extent Freud was influenced by Christianity um you know his in his upbringing and how it sort of he basically argues that you know um 
he was he was much more sympathetic actually to Christianity than what is often um said in like sort of like the more um popular or I should say you know accepted scholarly consensus on that issue so for what that's worth okay Susan are the classes held in person only yes this is not a hybrid program this is not an online program the site is an entirely in-person five-year on-site kind of thing APA accredited and so that's why Okay. Um, okay. This person's asked, Anna, how long is, how is your dissertation going? Oh, good question. <laughs> I'm still uh, defining it like the title so I can start signing um, my chair. So I already have someone in mind and most people at this point though, they already have their chairs. Um, so I'm one of the last ones, um, but I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> um, I think that's it for the chat. Let's, oh, somebody else in the Q&A. Tom, okay, Thomas, yeah, I, I talked about the transferring, right? So up to 18 credits, and that's still, it's still going to be five years. Okay. Um, can go, what is the title of the uh, book written by the fact that it's considered fine. Okay, so good question, Kinga. There's a couple that Vitz wrote. Um, the first is called Psychology as Religion. Um, and that he wrote that, I think, in 1977, published 1977. And there he kind of discusses the overall trajectory of the 20th century major humanistic psychologists, so like Abraham Maslow, um, Fred Rogers, things like this, people like that, um, and sort of like the project of self-actualization um, and whether or not that's compatible with Christianity. He mostly argues that it is not. Um, and so if you're interested in sort of like the sort of bits and his founding ideas and how that's related to um, our own project and fiction, highly recommend that book. Um, so I called, again, Psychology as Religion. Um, and then he wrote another, like I was saying, he wrote another book on Freud. The the title um, is escaping me. But if you just, if you Google like Witz, Freud, it's almost, yeah. Okay. So the, the author is Paul Witz, V-I-T-Z. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, good. Um, I think that's it. So we can, at this point can transition into the slideshow. So bear with me, I'm gonna bring up the slideshow here. Um, uh, Anna Lou, as I would go through this, please you know, interject and, let, inter and interrupt me even if, if you wanna add something and I'll sort of be um, asking you questions as well, sort of episodically. Okay. The question yes. yes okay okay so overview of the doctoral program at divine mercy university all right so dmu was originally founded as the institute of the psychological sciences um dedicated to the scientific study of psychology with a catholic christian understanding of the person oh gosh excuse me it's on the timer i apologize anyway um Dedicated to the scientific study of psychology um, with, an, with a particular emphasis on the understanding of person, marriage, and family. We did expand from the name IPS to Divine Mercy University in 2016 uh, to facilitate our own growth and also to add a counseling program. Um, so Divine Mercy has two distinct schools. We have the School of Counseling, like I had mentioned which is an, mostly an online program. And then the Institute of the Psychological Sciences um, has both the doctorates, which is residential, which is what we've been talking about. This is this ID. And then the Masters of Science and Psychology, which is an entirely online program. So our mission is to provide students with an effective academic and educational environment that supports the integration of the psychological sciences and a Catholic Christian understanding of the person by teaching and learning both knowledge and critical skills. Um, also to assist students intellectually and professionally as they prepare themselves to respond to the vocation as mental health professionals. So hopefully this will be you before too long. Okay, we're located outside of Washington, D.C. Um, in Sterling, Virginia. So we're decidedly in a suburban area. We're not really in the city itself, but nor are we um, in the middle of nowhere either. We're um, it's a nice sort of access to the city should you enjoy that kind of thing. And also if you enjoy um, outdoors stuff, that's also certainly on offer uh, to the West. 
Okay, as you can see, we have a series of institutional accreditations. We're accredited by SACS, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, which um, is an accreditation to be recognized by the Department of Education. Um, and Divine Mercy has voluntarily participated in the accreditation process, meeting or exceeding all standards and thorough evaluation. We're also approved to operate by SHEB, the State Council of Higher Education in Virginia. And um, the Saudi program has been recognized since 2006 as a national, excuse me, a national registered designation program by the Association of State and Provisional Psychology Boards. And also probably most notably is that we've been accredited by the APA, the American Psychological Association since 2016. Um, and then finally, DMU has been approved to participate in the National Council for State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement. So as you can see, we have virtually every accreditation possible. Okay, like I had mentioned and Anna had averted to, um, testing it forms an important element of our own program and sort of like a central to clinical psychology, which really kind of helps differentiate the clinical psychologists from most um, counselors. Okay, so here again, a five-year program, 122 credits all told, master's in passing after the second year. I do want to say a word about the curriculum itself. Um, as we can see, the curriculum is um, has some concentrated academics in the first and second years, much like you know um, Anna mentioned in medical school, it's like rigorous. This is rigorous in a similar way. Um, the front loading of the courses in the first two years, right, and then as you kind of move through it. Uh, the course is diminished somewhat, but you have a lot more clinical duties. So um, in the second year, you are, that's sort of your first foray into the clinic here on campus. Maybe you'll have a few clients. Um, but then as you get into the year three and four and you move off campus for your externship, you will um, have more of them. So usually between seven and nine clients in the third and fourth year. You can also see that um, you take comprehensive doctoral comprehensive exams at the end of your third year. Um, and then also um, you will have here again, like the internship off campus internship to which you will apply in your fifth year. That's uh, part of it. And then also the dissertation is kind of an ongoing thing. Like, like Anna had said, mentioned she's beginning the proposal process, um, but that's something that's kind of like very much kind of like perennially in progress. Um, most will defend hopefully by the end of the fifth year. Um, some don't finish by the end of the fifth year and that's totally fine. Um, they just kind of come back for year six and defend and it's no big deal. Um, okay, uh, we also, because we are APA accredited, we've had really excellent success in getting students into internships in the fifth year that are themselves APA internships. Um, we got our APA accreditation back in 2016. So back then, we had, as, as you can see here, 85% um, match rate, but now we're at 100% and we have been at 100% for the past couple of years. So the chances of you getting into an excellent APA internship is extraordinarily high. Um, these are a few questions of discernment. Um, you know, if we're thinking about PsyD, do you want to help people flourish? Are you interested in the science behind human behavior? Do you want to become an instrument of healing through the psychological sciences? Are you interested in performing psychological tests and assessments to diagnose your clients and create a treatment plan? And are you looking to start a career as a licensed mental health professional, specifically as a clinical psychologist? Do you have the ability to desire to work with all types of clients from acute care to more challenging long-term client cases? So if you're thinking um, yes to all of these questions, then this is probably a good fit for you. Okay, these are the major competency areas that we do aim to achieve in our program. So foundations in psych science and research, integrity and practice, assessment and diagnosis, therapeutic intervention, professional roles, and then clinical practice from a Catholic integrative perspective. I'll go through each of these kind of in more detail here. Okay, foundations in psych, psych science and research, graduates will attain foundational psychological science knowledge of biological, cognitive, effective, social, and developmental aspects of the human person, as well as history and systems of psychology, psychological measurement, research, design, and statistical method. Graduates will have the skills necessary to conduct their own psychological research. Two is integrity and practice. Graduates will be knowledgeable in the areas of diversity and ethics and display critical thinking, self-aware, and effective practice and self-care. Graduates will be demonstrate responsiveness to supervision, collegiality, and professional comportment and professional practice. Three is assessment and diagnosis. Graduates will be able to conduct clinical interviewing, perform intake evaluation, 
demonstrate knowledge in the administration of scoring and interpretation of psychological assessments, integrate multiple sources of test data, and clinical interview information into written reports, diagnose, and develop a treatment plan. Four, therapeutic intervention. Graduals be able to demonstrate case conceptualization, treatment planning, ability to maintain a therapeutic relationship, psychotherapy skills, crisis management of urgent and special circumstances, and discharge planning. Five, professional roles. Graduals be able to function in a variety of required roles of professional psychologists who include consultant, educator, supervisor, practice manager, and program evaluator. They'll be able to work collaboratively within the smart teams and with clients. Six, clinical practice from a Catholic and integrative perspective. Graduates will have developed a Catholic understanding of human flourishing in individual person, marriage, and family life, and be able to integrate this with psychological sciences in clinical practice. Okay, now, um, clinical psychology, as I'm sure many of you know, is a very diverse field. There are so many different areas that you can become expert within. But for the purposes of our program, the main task is getting you licensed so that you'll have, you'll be uh, PsyD, LCP, licensed clinical psychologist. And here again, then this means that you'll be able to practice in a variety of settings. So um, psychiatric hospitals, military establishments, uh, private practice, of course, outpatient clinics, diocese and consultation. This is a big one, especially, um, you know, if you're Catholic and you want to perhaps do testing for seminarians, the fittingness for, for ministry and things like that. Many um, Divine Mercy University society graduates are perfect um, for that. That's sort of like one of our specialties, you might say. Um, and also uh, clinical facilities, working within a clinical facility is very common for society grads. We've had really legions of students come through our school and flourish here and go on to succeed in this field of psychology. These are a few of many um, student testimonials. These are all um, PsyD graduates. James Wall, that just said, our clinical psych program and training is focused on healing the whole person. Kristen Long, I was drawn to the PsyD program. I was our to serve others in a more profound way than my previous positions offered. Timothy White, the school is not afraid to teach you what it means to be human at every level, psychologically, philosophically, theologically, and that's why I like it. And then Kirsten Curtis, I'm so thankful for DMU. The faculty members are very supportive and I received lots of hands-on clinical experience. Okay, so we have a video testimonial here from a recently graduated alumna. I would say that being a student at DY Mercy University or DMU is one of the best things that happens to me. I really appreciate a great support from faculty members and also classmates. I have gained a great deal of knowledge in all aspects of clinical practice, research, and also professional development. DMU not only provides students with strong academic skills, but also prepares them for a career in psychology. I personally benefit from mentorship with academic advisor and clinical supervisors. As a person, what I most appreciate from DMU is that its mission helped broaden my perspectives in understanding a human person through the lens of Catholicism, Catholic principle, especially in hope, love, and faith are very valuable and certainly helped me become a better clinician. So we have a generalist program in psychology here at DMU, which means that we have faculty with expertise across the curriculum from child and developmental to social and personality psychology, as well as all of the major uh, psychotherapeutic modalities from CBT, group therapy, marriage and family therapy, um, psychodynamic, um, among many others. All right. So um, this is our dean, uh, Dr. Lisa Klucki. She's a specialist in assessment and therapy. Dr. Graves is the assistant program director. She's a specialist in child and developmental psychology. Dr. Oriana is our um, director of clinical training. These three gentlemen here at the bottom are among the faculty that founded Divine Mercy. So back in 1999, Dr. Strafani was, or is or rather a specialist in CBT and group therapy. Dr. Nordling, a specialist in child marriage and family therapy. And then Dr. Vitz, uh, I mentioned him in some of his writings. Um, 
is really an expert on this business of how do we understand clinical psychology in light of Christianity, right? So Dr. Vitz's story is to me extremely inspiring. Um, he was actually once an atheist um, in his young days. In fact, he was an atheist until his very late thirties. In fact, um, he converted to Catholicism in the seventies with his wife, who was also an atheist professor. Um, and at the time they were at New York University teaching. And so when Dr. Vitz converted to Catholicism, he wanted to understand, well, how do we, you know, if Christianity is true, then how are we, how does that apply to um, the clinic, right? As a psychologist, kind of the question that um, Anna had mentioned at the outset of this, you know, um, what are we to make of this, you know, and, and are they reconcilable? Are they compatible? At any rate, so he started writing books on this topic. I had mentioned, you know, psychology as religion. Um, and later on, he wrote a book on Freud. He also uh, published a book around the time of our founding in 1999 called Faith of the Fatherless, which explores the question of how do we understand um, the, the uh, sort of plight of atheism in, in modernity? Um, and he argues that a lot of atheism is actually not so much intellectual as it is psychological. So he, what he does is he examines all the major atheistic philosophers from basically uh, David Hume to um, uh, Bertrand Russell in the 20th, 20th century. And he shows that for the most part, these men um, had very problematic father figures. You know, they were either absent fathers or abusive fathers or um, any number of, of issues that um, what Vitz is saying is that the way that man understands God is mediated through the father, the human father, right? Because if God is a father um, by analogy, um, how do we understand what God is except through our own fathers, right? And so if, um, as in the case of these guys, um, the having a, a wretched and wicked kind of father figure kind of uh, casts a kind of casts aspersions on, on God the Father, at least the way that we understand God the Father uh, through kind of human lights. Anyway, so all of these ideas are kind of uh, percolating in 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 the in the air within divine mercy and this is sort of um the story uh, of how we got going through mostly you know the, the story and, and life and uh writings of of dr paul bitz so we're very much in his in his debt all right um now okay this is somewhat more practical in terms of licensing uh yes obviously and certainly a license is required to practice as a clinical psychologist um while ultimately it is a student's responsibility to discover what those requirements are, the faculty here certainly do help students with this process, having um, having a lot of knowledge about it. Um, also, I would say that uh, getting into clinical psychology is not unlike, you know, if you wanted to become an attorney or a physician, um, getting the doctoral degree does not immediately confer licensure. So you need to, um, after you get your PsyD, you're going to be you're going to spend about a year in supervision. Um, under the supervision of a licensed clinical psychologist prior to becoming licensed. So usually that process about, is about nine to 12 months on average. Um, am I missing anything in, in particular here, Anna, or is that, is that a fair synopsis? I think that's, that's right. Okay, very good. Um, okay, these two charts depict a distinction I like to draw between buying something that's just entirely material, like in the case of the car is a good example because cars are notorious for losing value right there it's like you buy the car and then it just kind of declines in its value in the years thereafter by contrast um education um while much has kind of come to light in recent years about the value of education and putting calling into question this is quite distinct in the sense that there's an overwhelming demand for clinical psychologists and therapists in general right because our modern world is so beset by lots and lots of mental health issues. A lot of people will find themselves alone. Uh, they're suffering from, you know, isolation, addiction, uh, suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression, the whole gamut, among other things. Um, and so there's great demand for therapists. And also in particular with clinical psychologists, you know, having the highest level of academic and clinical expertise in this field puts you in, in, in somewhat of an elite category. So by the laws of supply and demand, we have a lot of, you know, obviously a demand for something and little supply. It's like you can make a good deal of money. Um, 
so what Anna mentioned in the beginning, obviously, maybe one ought not go into just for the sake of money, but at the same time, um, it's a feel that, you know, if you play your cards well and prudently, you can you can do very well financially, okay? Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, that. All that said, the investment itself is a 1,170 per credit for 122 credits over five years is 142,740. That's the, the full cost of the program. Most of our students do get um, federal aid, so through FAFSA and things like this. The FAFSA form does not become available until December 1st, so keep that in mind. Um, we also offer ways of deferring costs, so we do offer financial assistance through work-study programs on campus, uh, part-time jobs that help defray costs. Um, we also, for Catholic students, we offer discounts, um, provided you're able to show evidence that you're a parishioner and good standing at your parish. Um, we're usually the discount is something between 15 10% off of tuition. We also offer, um, as you can see, a slew of different scholarships to which you could apply. You can apply to up to four of these and receive up to two of them. Um, they pay out up to the amount indicated here to the right. Our um, website provides a lot more information uh, about each of these, um, divinemercy.edu. So I certainly encourage all of you to take a look at all of those to see which ones were apropos to you. We also offer um, merit scholarships. So those range from half off of tuition being our highest um, scholarship to maybe a quarter off of tuition. Um, and the way this works is these are not, the merit scholarships are not things to which you apply specifically, rather they're doled out by the faculty um, on the basis of, well, merit, right? So uh, students are ranked um, in each of the interviews according to their merits. And this is a, a sort of made in a number of different uh, evaluation scale. So how well the interview goes, um, your how compelling are your essays, your recommendations, your GRE, your career grades. It's all kind of seen as a whole. You're really evaluated and, and it's the entirety of the application. Um, so we're not just looking for grades or anything like that, but certainly um, they play a role. Also, we offer a early admissions scholarship, okay, of $3,000. Um, in the first year of study. So what, what that means is this. So we have three different interview days. So these are the days that you come to campus to interview for a program. As you can see, we have one coming up here in November, November 10th. Um, this one is overwhelmingly our most popular interview because um, of the early admission scholarship that I mentioned. But also we do, I would say on average, the faculty tends to dole out most of the merit scholarships in this application. So here we are, you know, kind of we're, we're kind of moving toward the end of September. Um, so while this is an extraordinarily popular interview, and at this point, I think less than half of the slots are available, um, there's still time left. So, I'll be a limited time, but um, if you're serious and, and you want to get in, take advantage of this uh, early scholarship money, um, email me, talk to me, um, get a hold of me, and we can talk, and I can help you move through the process um, as uh, quickly as, as possible. Um, now, in terms of requirements for entrance, we do require at least a, a baccalaureate degree um, from a regionally accredited school. While we do prefer that students have studied psychology, by no means is that required We've had students come to our program from all kinds of backgrounds, from the humanities to the hard sciences and, and everything in between. Um, if you do not have any psychology background, you will likely be required to take a prerequisite, prerequisite class over the course of the first year concurrently with your other coursework. This is a online class. It's quite easy. Dr. Morse teaches it. It's basically a, um, you might say, an undergraduate course spread out over two semesters. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, also, we do require at least a 3.0 GPA. If you are in the category of people that has um, something on the cusp of that, say if you had a, like a 2.8, 2.9, maybe 2.7, whatever, um, that's not necessarily disqualifying, but certainly come talk to me um, and um, perhaps that's something that can be overcome. So and that's you, despair not. Um, we have admitted people with less than a 3 in the past, so there's that. Um, okay, now in terms of the process itself, um, the first thing to do is provided all of this makes sense is to submit an online application. 
Um, and then once that's in, the financial aid department will get in touch with you and then we'll maintain communication until all the other elements of the application are received, at which point we collate the application and the dean will, God willing, invite you to an interview. As I mentioned, there are three of them and this one in November is the most um, up and coming. Okay, the others are January 26th and March 8th. Now, as to the application itself, the first thing to do is the online app that can be done pretty easily. Um, it can be found on our even on our website. Um, but once that's in, these are the other elements that will be required. Okay, so two essays, they'll be about why you want to be a clinical psychologist and why divine mercy. The other one will be about your research interests. Of course, we'll also need your updated resume. And then three recommendations, um, two of which should be from professors, but if you're sort of far removed from college, and you can't um, provide those, we can certainly be fine with um, work supervisors. But what we don't want, however, are um, recommendations from family or friends or boyfriends or girlfriends or therapists or any of that. They, they should be um, professional, uh, work supervisors offering um, us their evaluation of your um, professional work ethic and things like competence, things like that. Okay, and then um, transcripts. Certainly, we need your uh, all of your post secondary transcripts. If you've gone to graduate school, we'll need your graduate transcripts as well. And then the GRE, we do require the GRE, but it's not as if the GRE is like the most important thing. Um, I don't know if we've ever turned down anyone necessarily nearly on the grounds of having a low GRE score. So if you bear that in mind, this is something that a lot, of, it bogs a lot of people down, the GRE, um, and they, they get nervous and, and all the rest. But the thing is, is that um, I highly recommend just kind of taking it, doing the best you can, and then leaving the rest to God, because there's so much more that we're looking at than the GRE. Okay. Um, lastly, for international applicants, um, if you hold a degree outside of the U.S., um, it will be, have to be evaluated um, through a course-by-course -course evaluation, such as West.org. If you go to West.org, it will show you and prompt you how to submit your transcript for American evaluation and distill it into GPA, because other countries have different grading systems. Um, your degree, if it is uh, obtained from a place outside of America, should be the equivalent of an American bachelor's degree. If it isn't in English, it will need to be translated into English. This is, of course, all of your responsibility and the cost supports your own. Finally, if English is not your primary language, and by that I mean this, I'm not asking whether or not it was your native language, because there are plenty of people uh, for whom English is not a native language, but it's the language that they're uh, used to conversing in in their professional and personal life. If that's you, then consider English your primary language and state that in the application itself, okay? Um, otherwise, if you don't, it will um, basically re require you to take the TOEFL to demonstrate mastery of English. Um, and that's sort of like one more thing to do. But um, if you can honestly say that English is not your primary language. If it isn't really what you're used to conversing in, then we you will have to demonstrate um, English mastery through a TOEFL or an ILS academic test. So let's see if we have any other questions before we conclude here. Okay, we, Thomas, we talked about your question. Let's see. Last week, it sounded like I am not the only one who would like to see the jury eliminated. Any hope for this? <laughs> um, so... It is true that um, the GRE is, especially in recent years and in, in the wake of COVID, um, the GRE uh, has become uh, less required. You know, few, fewer institutions um, are requiring it. You know, many are kind of dispensing with it. Um, now, but in terms of our own school, we have an agreement, a uh, standing agreement at the top for the time being with the APA that it is part of our um, a necessary requirement for admission. And so for the time being, it will be required. Um, we are soon going to be reevaluating this, but that won't be until 2025 at the earliest. So that's sort of like a plain fact of life for the time being. Um, that's just kind of the way it is. I'm sorry if that's bad news for you, Kinga. Um, what are the concentrations in the ID? Okay. Formally speaking, there are no like concentrations. I mean, we have um, 
you know, I'm a master of science in psychology where you can uh, concentrate and say like marriage and family or pre PhD or organizational psychology, things like this, things of that nature. But strictly speaking, there aren't, there isn't like a series of different concentrations per se. But that said, you know, when you dissertate and you compose a dissertation of a couple hundred pages, there's a way in which that is kind of like an unofficial concentration of sorts, because you become, you're, you're contributing to the field of psychology in an original way, you're making an original contribution. So that's kind of a concentration. Anna, did you want to speak to that point at all? No, I wouldn't know what to add, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, I think that's basically all that can really be said um, to that question. Okay. Can completion of DMU's online analysis and psychology count toward this study for Okay. Yeah. So this is, um, what we hit on earlier on in the, in the uh, presentation, the, the short answer is no for this reason. Um, the clinical psychology PsyD is, well, clinical, and the Master of Science in Psychology is non-clinical. Um, also, there are, the PsyD has full 15-week semester uh, requirements for courses, whereas the um, MSP has, I think, eight-week cycles, so they're just not they're not co compatible in the same way. So um, unfortunately, there isn't really any um, transfer from one to the other. Um, so sorry about that. All right, Kinga, is the 2025 the next AP accreditation cycle um, or the DOE accreditation cycle? Yeah, 2025 is, to my understanding, is the A's, the APA's um, reevaluation of our program, to my knowledge. Um, so that's that. I think that's it. Yep, you're welcome, Kinga. Um, good. All right. That was a lot, but we made it. Um, Anna, Lou, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for all of your lovely questions. And I really wish you the best of luck discerning this next step that you're planning on taking. Just remember that uh, think about you, what's best for you and for the world. So good luck with that. Well said. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you very much, Anna Lou. Um, everybody else, um, please get in touch with me, decipher at divinemercy.edu. Um, I'd be happy to speak with you, be happy to help you answer any other questions that you might have. Until then, goodbye and God bless.